So when we start considering the difference between ideal and practical filters, let's go back to our ideal low pass filter and try to determine what the transform, the Fourier transform of this is going to be. So in the frequency domain, it's easy to deal with this ideal low pass filter in the, in the frequency domain. And that's because it basically looks like this brick or block where we have across the, the band of interest, we see no amplitude change. So everything passes through, it's not distorted. It stays constant at one. And then in the uh, phase, we have a uh, phase response that is linear. It has a constant slope that does not change through this. So easily we can consider this filter in the frequency domain. And this should make us think, okay, so what would happen if we took the inverse Fourier transform of this? So what if we started to look at this in the time domain? Would we learn something new that tells us something about ideal low pass filters. So if we continue along this line, let's break down the filter in the frequency domain and work towards considering how to analyze it in the time domain. So in the frequency domain, we would have this um, pi or rectangle function, right, describing our amplitude response. So we can describe our amplitude response using uh, this special function that we considered in some previous videos. And if we do that, we can write the total transfer function, right? The transfer function is going to be the amplitude response multiplied by e raised to the j of the phase response. So plugging in this set for the amplitude response and this for the angle response, we get this equation, which describes the transfer function of our ideal low pass filter. Now recall, we like to think about our communication systems as being linear time invariant systems, which have a certain set of properties. So LTI, the stable LTI systems can be characterized in the time domain by the impulse response, uh, little h of t, which is system response y of t to a unit impulse x of t equals delta t. So what does that mean? This means that if you make an impulse as your input, and it passes through our LTI system, then our output is going to be y of t is equal to h of t. So our output is going to be equal to our transfer function if we put in this impulse response as, as the input. So again, we're, we're trying to think about what's going to happen to the transform of this, this function, and we're going to analyze it now by saying, okay, we're gonna think about this like a system, we want to know what the time domain transfer function is. So let's consider what happens if we put an impulse response uh, through a system and try to find the output y of t. So <clears throat> we're going to now find the inverse of this. And you can use some of the tables in the books um, to find this. And what you get is that the Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform of this, which is the time domain transfer function, is going to take this form with this sync function. And that makes sense, right? Because we already saw some previous videos, right, that this uh, rectangle function leads to sync function responses. And this is, this is an important set of uh, relationships, and we're going to see why right now. So when you do this, we have this, this is our, our frequency domain. And what that means is if you pass this uh, through a inverse Fourier transform, you get this in the time domain, right? So just like we looked at in the previous videos, the sync function is a response. This is the what the system response would be. So if you took our uh, frequency domain uh, transfer function, and we convert this into the time domain, what we see is that we have a sync function in the time domain, which means that our system response, the way that the system reacts to this, in, this input impulse is going to look like a sync function. Now, what, what does that mean? And why is that actually going to be a problem? Well, if our impulse function written like this starts at time zero, we can see right now that this part of our transfer function. So this part of our transfer function in the time domain is actually responding to this input 
before the input exists. So clearly that's a problem, right? We cannot realize that in real life. So we call this non-causal, we call this transfer function, this time domain response, we call it non-causal, unrealizable, or not practical. And this is why the pure, ideal, low-pass filter uh, will not be able to be realized in a practical way. You have a part of the transfer function which actually has to respond to a system input before the system input exists.